Okay, uh, so I'm here to talk to you about REOC MapReduce. Uh, my name is Sean Cribbs, and uh, this fun picture that's up on this first slide was on the first page of Google Image Search when I searched for head, and I thought it was appropriate because uh, the man has his head in the sand, and uh, when you're doing a declarative query la language, you can ignore a lot of things, uh, but when you're doing MapReduce, you have to pull your head out. So uh, let's get started. Uh, first, and this slide never aligns properly, who am I? Uh, this is me from last month. I work for Bachelor Technologies. We make REOC, um, and I code, and it got clipped off the bottom as I expected it would. Code in Ruby, Erlang, and JavaScript. I do uh, both client-side and server-side JavaScript. <coughs> so let's take a look at what REOC is very briefly, and then we'll talk about uh, MapReduce and how you can use MapReduce in REOC. So REOC is a scalable, highly available networked key value store. Scalable meaning that it scales linearly as you add nodes. Uh, highly available is a focus on fault tolerance and uh, being able to accept writes at all times. Networked meaning that it operates across a number of nodes. Uh, and it's a key value store, so its primary data model is storing values under keys. And I think the best way to explain how REOC works is this awesome animated GIF that uh, Matthias Meyer made. Um, so basically, in this cluster, we have eight nodes. Um, and when you send a write to one node, it goes out to any of the, the nodes in the cluster that that key belongs on, and it replicates three times. Um, and then when you lose a node, writes can still occur, and, but they go to fallbacks. And when that no, the node that, that failed comes back, the data gets transferred back to it. So this is how uh, REOC achieves fault tolerance and linear scalability. Uh, the REOC data model, uh, again, I said REOC stores values against keys. So you generally need to know the key when you're looking up something. Uh, but unlike some other systems, it lets you encode your data how you like it, uh, which means you have to take greater responsibility for marshalling that in and out of your application. But it can basically store anything that you can give a MIME media type. And keys are grouped into buckets, which are kind of lightweight namespaces. Uh, they have no meaning other than to prefix the key, but they're a nice way to, to organize your data. So being a key value store, REOC has some basic operations, which are get to fetch a key. Um, and this is how it would look over HTTP. Uh, put, you put a key there with the value, and you can delete. So you can use HTTP. We also have a binary interface uh, that uses Google's protocol buffers for serialization only. It doesn't use protocol buffers RPC, so don't go looking at PVC, RPC. Um, and uh, so pretty simple operations, key value store. But REOC also stores metadata with your keys. So uh, whenever you send a key into REOC, you need to provide a content type. What, you know, is this JSON? Is it XML? Is it a serialized Java object? And whatever. Uh, you need to provide that. Uh, but it also keeps things like the last modified date. Uh, and uh, you can connect, uh, you can use the link header in HTTP uh, to connect objects, to, which are, when I say object further in this presentation, don't be confused. That means, in REOC, it means the value combined with the metadata. Uh, but you can relate objects to one another via links, which are basically like links in HTML. Uh, and then you can provide extra headers for user-specific metadata, things that your application only cares about and the REOC doesn't, but REOC will happily store that for you. So that's the basic overview. There are two ways to query Re REOC. Today, I'm not going to talk about this one, which is link traversal. Um, I'll talk about it kind of tangentially in the context of MapReduce. Um, but the, uh, the main primary way to query REOC, other than key value, is MapReduce. So this is probably going to be really uh, banal stuff for some of you who are familiar with Hadoop. How many of you do Hadoop already? Yeah, there's lots in the room. So this is going to be like you know, MapReduce 101, and you're going to be bored. I apologize. So first of all, what MapReduce is not, it's not a query language. It's not a framework. It's not a database. It's not just Hadoop. Other people have MapReduce. Uh, but instead, it's an actually a computational style. So you're talking about two functions primarily a map function, which operates on single items of data, and a reduce function, which operates on collections of data. So these are just patterns. These aren't necessarily a way that you structure, uh, a strict structure to the way that you build 
a query, or a job. These are just the tools you have to use. So why would Reoc use MapReduce? Well, Reoc is a networked key value store. MapReduce is nicely composable into small pieces, and so it's easy to distribute the code around the network to get data locality. Um, and because you have the scalability of a linear scaling data store, you can also scale your MapReduce jobs up and down. If you add more nodes, you get more com computational capacity. Anybody who's done Hadoop knows, knows this. You get more comp compute when you have more nodes. And again, it's just code. Uh, you know, you can write a declarative uh, uh, query in SQL, uh, but there's no code there. It's a declaration of what you want. Here, you have complete, well, I say near complete control over how your query is executed. And it's just code. So you're just, all you have to understand is the map function and the reduce function. So let's look at map. Map is essentially for each datum that you're trying to process, you have one call of that function. Uh, in React's case, it actually loads the data from disk and passes it from, to that function. Uh, things you can do in map are extract data from your value. You can transform data into uh, other values. You can filter data, so you can choose to return no results or lots more results, depending on what, what you want, uh, to, what, you, what your goal is. Reduce takes n data and calls it m times. Now, I say this because although in many frameworks uh, you only call reduce once, there's no restriction uh, necessarily on how often you call reduce. In fact, Reoc will call reduce multiple times as data comes in from previous phases. Things you want to do in reduce uh, are typical aggregate type functions, like sum, count, group. Uh, you might want to sort your items or limit them to a certain number. Uh, there's some architectural limitations on how you can do limit, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Or you might find the minimum or the maximum or gather some uh, statistics like quantiles, uh, mean, median, mode, stuff like that. So let's look at MapReduce in Reoc. And actually, I was worried if I was going to go over time, but I'm going real fast. This is great. So uh, please stop me if you have any question or anything that's unclear. So let's start again with what Reoc MapReduce is not. React MapReduce is not for batch processing. So if you want to do a job that takes hours, you do not want to use React yet. Uh, we're actually working on a, a rewrite of MapReduce, which will let it scale up and down better. But uh, it's also, if you're familiar, how many of you use CouchDB? Anybody? Yeah, there's quite a number. So CouchDB uses MapReduce to build indexes that you can query. React uh, MapReduce is not for building indexes. Uh, it's also not for crunching your entire data set. Remember I said if things take hours, you don't want to do them with React. You also don't want to, and something that Matthias mentioned in his talk earlier, you don't want to list keys and then crunch all of that data. It's just, it's, it's not good. And this is a particular quirk of React's MapReduce. You're not limited to one map and one reduce. You can do as many of them as you want in any combination and order, uh, as long as the inputs to the functions make sense. So React MapReduce is for low latency jobs and queries. So the concept of, <coughs> excuse me, React MapReduce is to be done with, say, for example, in the span of a single web request. So if you've got an application, it needs to fetch some data from React, you should be able to get the latency down to where it's acceptable within a single request. Uh, we t typically encourage people to use limited, well-known inputs. So it's a big bonus if your data is structured such that you know keys. You know the keys you're looking for. They may not exist. They may exist. They may have data in them. They may be empty. But as long as you can tell React MapReduce what those keys are, uh, you're going to be in better shape. And again, it, has, it lets you do any sequence of map and reduce functions. So uh, some interesting things about React MapReduce features. Uh, you can write your functions in JavaScript or in Erlang. So that comic that Matthias talked about earlier about, you know, you have to write a distributed map reduce function in Erlang, that was about React. Um, and I should have put that comic in our presentation, but I didn't. Uh, so if you like JavaScript, which all my examples today are going to be in, uh, you can use JavaScript. Uh, certain things go faster in Erlang, so you might want to look at those, uh, learning Erlang if you want that. Uh, there's link phases. I mentioned link walking. Uh, before, link walking was actually the primary use case uh, and driving design uh, of React's MapReduce uh, and the idea that you follow links from one object to another. 
Uh, there's also key filters, so if you want to be uh, only mildly bad and uh, list keys on a bucket, uh, you can provide some predicates for the shape of those keys. So uh, some people do things like embed the date of the item in the key, and you could filter the list of keys just to ones from specific dates. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, there's input generators, which basically is just a function that will feed keys to a MapReduce job. Um, and this is used by React Search uh, to query uh, search index and then feed that, those results from the query into MapReduce. Uh, and then there's a couple minor things. Uh, you can provide key-specific data. Uh, what this means is, in, in addition to just the bucket and key you provide to the MapReduce job, you can tell it, here's this arbitrary data item that I want associated with that bucket and key when it gets to the map phase. Um, and that comes in as an extra parameter to the function. And there's also phase-specific data, which we call the arg. Uh, and uh, that applies across all applications of the function in the map or reduce phase. So this is a big overview. Uh, there are a couple quirks with React MapReduce. Uh, as, because React lets you encode your data how you want it, values are essentially opaque. So if you want to inspect the data that you're uh, looking at, uh, you have to know the format. Uh, is it CSV? Is it JSON? Is it XML? Those are things that people typically use. Um, some of our uh, older customers who have Erlang infrastructure use Erlang binary format. Um, so basically, you just need to know what the how the value is structured in your map phase and, uh, and interpret it appropriately. Uh, map, phase, map phases only take input lists. So uh, even though you may want to process an item as, you know, in isolation, uh, if it's not a bucket key lookup, map won't do it. You have to do it and reduce. So uh, if you have a map phase that comes later in your job, and we'll, we'll see some of those later in this presentation, um, it has to give, it has to receive bucket key or bucket key key data as its inputs. Uh, I mentioned earlier, Erlang is faster than JavaScript. We have an embedded spider, mon spider monkey engine, but you have to marshal the data from Erlang into JavaScript and back uh, whenever you have a JavaScript call. So if you absolutely need the utmost speed, Erlang is where it's at right now. Uh, but if you can achieve a small performance improvement uh, by preloading JavaScript functions. So, uh, you know, a lot of people are, are interested in ad hoc queries, and that's great in development, but most of the time, you know, even if you're using an SQL database, uh, you would know the queries by the time you go to production, and so you can optimize those. So it makes sense to build functions that you're going to use frequently into, uh, you know, a JavaScript file and have React load that when it starts up. Um, and I mentioned that reduce can be applied multiple times. Uh, in CouchDB, this is called re-reduce. Um, but in React, you have no context about whether re-reduce is happening. You have to assume it's always happening. So uh, you have to treat your inputs and your outputs the same. They have to basically be in the same domain or detectable uh, when, you, when you apply a reduce function. Okay, so here's a simple MapReduce query to React. This one's really kind of dumb. It doesn't do much. Uh, but you send a post request to the MapRed resource. Uh, you give it the content type of application JSON. I left out a bunch of the other headers. And it's this JSON object. And you see at the, at the top, uh, there's the inputs. And these are bucket key pairs. It's a list of bucket key pairs. And then the query uh, property there contains the list of phases. And each phase is a JavaScript object. It has a single key, map, reduce, or link. Um, and then inside that inner object is a specification of which function to run, uh, what language it's in, and whether you want to return results. So that's one thing I didn't mention. Uh, you can return results from intermediate phases. So if you're doing a long traversal through a bunch of different data, you want to receive earlier phases as well, uh, those can come back to the client. OK, so we're actually going to run this query. Here it's all pretty printed in JSON over here. And uh, let's run that. OK. So I got, uh, you got some JSON data back. Uh, Matthias insisted I have an ASCII dong in his presentation. Um, but uh, so it went and fetched the people Sean Cribs and the people Road Rage keys, and it interpreted them as JSON and sent the results back to the client. 
and we put in that text, text field. OK, so here's the point in this presentation. I gave you an overview really fast. So let's look at how you can take these ideas that you're familiar with in doing SQL queries and turn them into things that you can use practically in doing MapReduce queries in REOC. So the first thing people want to do is select. So with select, you generally select some fields. You pull back only the fields you want, or you select some function combined with fields. So select fields in React MapReduce would essentially be a map phase. And that, the purpose of that map phase is to extract or to transform the data. So in this example, um, what we did is uh, we passed, and I'm sorry, there's an error in my function. This arg out here should be called field. No, no, I apologize. That's correct. So if we gave it a list in that arg, uh, which is the phase specific arguments, uh, if we gave it a list of field names we wanted to extract, uh, then this would interpret the React object we fetched, the value, as JSON. Uh, and then it's going to build this uh, result object, which just extracts the individual fields from, uh, from the value and then returns them. Now, you notice that down here at the bottom, uh, the map phase returns a list. And map phases always return lists as well as reduce. This lets you actually return nothing if you want. So there's always a, a list as a return value. You could actually return multiple results here. OK, so any questions about select fields? That's pretty straightforward, right? OK, let's look at where. So in a where clause, you provide a bunch of conditions, things that you want to match upon. Um, and uh, things that you want to limit or combine. Uh, where can be implemented in a couple ways. The first way that I'm going to talk about is a map phase. And this is essentially a filter. So you're using map as a filter to return data or not return data. In this case, we want to see that the data's year is 2011. So say this is like a log entry. Um, we only want the ones from 2011. Uh, so we'll parse the JSON again, and then we'll see if the year is, 20, is 2011, we'll return that data, otherwise we'll return nothing. And this is actually, uh, because this is such a common pattern, this is a built-in function you can use uh, that, that ships with React. It's called map by fields, and you just give it an object that is this equals this. This field of this object equals this, and it will return items that match that specification and you know, return nothing if it doesn't match. The second way you could do uh, a where condition is with a key filter, which I mentioned before. And this is what key filters look like. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at the logs bucket. And we've given it a bunch of filters. And these are basically applied to one another in a sort of monadic or uh, compositional pattern. Uh, so it'll take the key and tokenize it on the dashes. So let's assume, in this case, that your log objects have a date embedded in them that has the year and month and day separated by dashes. Uh, so you tokenize on the dash, and you take the first one, convert it to an integer. Is it greater than 2010? That will limit the list of inputs to only those ones that contain 2011 or 2012, et cetera. Uh, and I mentioned React Search. The third way you can do a where condition is by feeding your MapReduce job with a search query. In this case, uh, we provide a function specification. Uh, in Erlang terms, they call it MFA, a module function and the arguments. And what we really are concerned with here is the arg. And that first argument to the function is the index you're going to query. So you have the opportunity in React Search to automatically index objects as they're inserted into React KV. And in this case, we're going to say, is the year 2011? Pretty simple Lucene-style search query. And that will feed results back to my MapReduce, where I can do other things. Question? OK. Ah, here's the hard one from SQL, right? Join. So I'm going to hand wave a little bit about this. Uh, typically in uh, React, because your values are opaque and you don't have functional key constraints and all the things you expect when you want to do joins in an SQL, SQL database, you typically tend to denormalize things and put things under a single key. But uh, there are some cases, especially cases where you might be writing one part of a, of a 
should be denormalized thing more than another, um, that you'd want to separate them. So one way um, that you can deal with this is to use a map or a link phase. And the basic, uh, and followed by another map phase, my apologies. Uh, the basic form of it is to extract some data from the object and then return a bucket and key pair and possibly some key data. So if you wanted to join, say, all of the people you have with a bunch of emails, I don't know, I'm making this up on the fly, uh, you might take a look at their, uh, the emails and extract all of the people information and then pass the related information to the next phase as key data. Now, if you just wanted to follow links, you know, uh, React lets you set links on objects which act like HTML links, I mentioned. You can just say, well, let's follow uh, a link that matches the specification. Uh, you can give it, uh, you know, the objects need to be in this bucket or they need to have this tag on the link, uh, which is sort of, a sort of little metadata. Um, you can just uh, follow from one object to another. And the link phase is actually just a special kind of map phase, which does essentially what that uh, function above does. Okay, now we're to the later parts of the SQL query, right? So we have order by, and you give it some fields. You want to sort by these fields. Well, in React MapReduce, you do that with a reduce phase. So uh, reduce phases uh, take a list of values as the first argument, uh, and the second argument is that phase-specific data. In this case, we're, we're going to pass what field do we want to sort on. And this is a really simple uh, function. You just return the values.sort in JavaScript, and you give it a comparator function to determine what order they should go in. And this is actually a built-in function as well. Uh, it's called react.reduceSort. And if you want to customize how it sorts, you know, JavaScript by default, and this, you have to be careful with this because this, this bit me before, JavaScript will uh, sort lexically, uh, even across numbers. So uh, generally, you want to pass a comparator function. Um, and if you just pass it as a string in that arg, it'll get evaluated uh, into the sort. Okay, here's a trickier one. You want to limit to numbers, a specific number of results. Now, remember how I said earlier that reduce may be applied multiple times? Okay, this presents a challenge because you don't know if you've got the whole result set each time the reduce is applied. Now, you can get around this, however, and that is to make your limit be the second reduce function. So you'd have perhaps a sort function first that made sure that it collected all the results and made sure they were in order, and then you could pass it to this limit function, uh, which would be second, and that would only receive the full set of results. And this basically just takes the values that it receives and slices the array uh, given the length as the phase argument. And this is also a built-in function called react.reduceLimit. Okay, and here's, here's a bit more complicated one, group by. Um, now, group by is usually a combination of select something along with the group by phase. And you, or I'm sorry, the group by uh, clause. And you give it fields that you want to group in hierarchically. Uh, so with group by, you would have to translate it to a map function and a reduce function. And in the map function, what you would do is extract the data that you need and then create a key that it will be collected under in the return result. So in this case, we're collecting all of the data by year. So our result is just an object that has the year as, as a key in the object, and in some part of the data, it may be the whole thing, it may be just a portion of it, is included in, uh, in a list of results. And then you pass it to a reduce function. And this reduce function will go across all of the values it receives and collate all the items into a single object. So you notice in this previous slide, I returned a list of, I'm sorry, an array. I keep using the, the functional terms. Uh, I returned an array that has the data. That was intentional so that in the reduce phase, you can just push items on the end of that list. You can conc concat them together. Uh, there's a bit of parallelism in React's reduce. There's two processes running reduce at any time. Um, and so you may get them collated in different groups, and then you want to collect them all together. So uh, more explanation about this. Uh, 
Yeah, so it's going to, for each item, it's going to fold over the list. And for every field in that object that you've returned, it's going to concatenate them to the accumulator. OK, so that's group by. Uh, count sum, min, and max are very similar to group by. You would use both a map and a reduce. Uh, so like the group by, you would map to a specific value, and then you would reduce to collate those values uh, uh, together. Uh, there's some built-in functions, so if you're just returning integers, uh, reduce sum, reduce min, reduce max, uh, will just do that automatically for you without any extra work. And those are built-ins. Okay, so that was a lot of heavy content. I'm totally seeing glazed eyes, so let's look at a practical example. Yeah. So this is a fun problem uh, that you can solve with MapReduce. Of my social network friends, who are the top five who have the most friends in common with me? There are a lot of, uh, you might do this with Hadoop, actually. I'm, I imagine that the LinkedIn does stuff with Hadoop to solve these problems. Uh, so we need to start off by making a strategy. You know, it's not SQL. You can't do it declaratively. So you have to figure out how to do it procedurally. So let's first fetch the friends list. I have a list of friends. It's probably stored as a single object. So let's, let's fetch those. And then from that, we're going to fan out. And we're going to collect all of my other friends lists, their friends. This gets really circular and confusing really quick, doesn't it? And then I'll find the number in common. So uh, I'll pass along my list when I go to find theirs and compare them. And then we'll sort the list by the count of all of those that were collected and then limit to the top five. So this translates to, uh, if you hadn't guessed yet, two maps and two reduces. So the first thing, you want to get the, my friends list. So I'm going to start with this input, which is friends Sean Cribs. So assuming my handle is Sean Cribs, in the friends bucket is going to be my friends list. And then let's look at the map. In this case, I've decided to represent the friends list as a flat text file, essentially, that uh, has new lines separated. So uh, I'll grab the value from the object that I've fetched, uh, which is going to be my friends list, right? And then split it on new lines. So now I have a list of nicknames or usernames. And I'll sort it just to be nice. And then uh, and this, this next step is a little bit confusing, but it's simply for easing the comparison so we don't have an n squared problem. We instead have an order n problem uh, in the next phase. And that's I build up an object where all of the keys are my friends and the value in that object is just one. We don't care. We're just testing that it exists. And then uh, I'll go, I'll map across the list. Uh, and knowing that, that those items in that list are their usernames and will be the key under which their friends lists are stored. Uh, and I'll pass along that hash list that I created. So the next phase is going to be maps, so we need to return a list of bucket key key data. And that's exactly what we're doing. OK, the second map counts the friends in common. So it's going to take the object that was fetched, which is my friend's friends. And the second argument is that key data that I passed along from the previous phase. So uh, it's kind of a forwarding data flow pipe type idea. Um, and we're basically going to do the same thing. Since it's a list of friends just like my list was, we'll split on new lines. And you know, those are all, all of the, the people who, who I follow. And then uh, in this uh, next part, we reduce across the list, which is to uh, build up a count of how many people are in common. So for each item that, that my friend is a friend of, uh, we'll check if I'm a friend of that person too, and then add to the count if so. If not, just return the same. And then we return who they are, which is the key of the object, right, and the total count of friends in common. OK. The next phase is a bit easier. Uh, we are going to sort the list descending by the count. Um, and there's a little uh, quirk here that I had to put in uh, for the sake of limiting the size of data that I inserted into REOC for this example. Um, but that's possible that I don't have the friends list for everybody in this example. So if that, that key is not found, you'll start to receive 
these objects that say not found bucket key um, in, in, the, uh, in any one of the phases. And so when you get to a reduce phase, those come through, you need to filter them out. So we're just going to toss out the ones that are not found. We don't care. And then we're going to sort it descending by the count. So previously, I had A greater than B. Uh, in this case, I want to do A less than B, so it goes in reverse order. OK? And the final one, now that they're sorted, we can limit to the top five. So in this case, I don't have to write that function. It's built in. It's the reduce limit function. Um, and uh, I'll just uh, specify react.reduce limit. The argument is five, saying we only want five entries. And then we finally, the keep parameter to this job says, I want to return these results. So we only care about the last phase. All right, the moment of truth. We're going to run this. So this is the job. Um, because the functions are in line, they look kind of funky. They've been encoded into JSON. Uh, you see that last phase down here. I put a huge timeout on there. I didn't know how long this is going to run, so uh, let's run it. And it's actually pretty snappy. And it says that I have 84 friends in common with Tom Preston Warner. And there are actually only four people. Hmm, OK. I have a lot in common with Matthias, too, 66. OK, so to wrap it up, to do React MapReduce, what do you want to do? You want to think procedurally, not declaratively. You've got to think about both how your data is structured, how you want to process it, and what you want the output to look like. You need to plan out your queries step by step. Uh, you can do them incrementally. For example, just write the first map phase. See, does it work? Does it output what I want? Then add another phase, a reduce or another map, um, and see that that produces what you want. So you don't have to do it all in one shot like I did in the example. Uh, yeah, execute them incrementally. And then in order to be successful, you definitely want to avoid full bucket map. And uh, if you saw Matthias' NoSQL talk earlier, he's like, we tell people not to list keys. Yeah, this is basically us telling you not to list keys. OK, take note. Um, we're going to fix that real soon. Uh, go to OzCon data. Go to Rusty Klopas' talk, and you'll see how. Um, be aware that your reduce functions will be applied multiple times. So you have to think about that. Think that the, do the domain of your outputs is the same as the domain of your inputs. Or at least you need to be able to detect when the domain is different and do something accordingly in your reduce functions. Uh, if you structure your key space well, your map reduce jobs will be much easier. So um, as long as you know what to look for, it's going to be a lot simpler. Uh, and actually, this spring, I made a, uh, I built some indexes, some geospatial indexes on top of Rioc, specifically because I could use a, a spatial, uh, space-filling curve and look up the keys I knew I wanted. Um, and so you can do, if you structure your key space smartly, you can do really complicated things very simply. Uh, if you've got really slow queries, don't use JavaScript. Convert them to Erlang or consider restructuring your key space. And then as you go toward production, build a library of common functions. This is going to make them run faster. It's also going to be easier to debug. Um, and you'll be able to tie the functions you use inside React to the rest of your deployment process. So if you want more resources on React or MapReduce, uh, we have a great, pretty great wiki that's under constant work. Uh, there's a what we call React Function Contrib, which has a bunch of useful functions for MapReduce. Um, and then we have a couple of videos. Uh, there's some on, uh, on schema design for React, which is basically how to design your key space. Um, and then uh, there's one on MapReduce. Uh, there's uh, going to be more coming up in the next couple months. So thank you, and I appreciate questions. This presentation, if you're looking for it, it's on GitHub under GitHub Sean Cribs bbuzz dash react dash mapred. You can email me at sean at basher.com. I'm also on Twitter, Twitter at Sean Cribs. So I'll take any questions now. Yes? Why, why did you say it was not appropriate for batch processing? Because it is not built to recover from long running jobs. The timeout in, internally are small, and it was originally designed for small online queries. It's not designed to process your whole key space. And that's, so let, let, me, let me addendum to that. We are working to change that um, so that you could both use it for short online queries as well as long-running batch jobs. 
The other issue is that there's no way without writing it in Erlang to directly save your results back into React. It's intended to be within a single web request. Okay. Um, is there a possibility to uh, to chain um, built-in functions go in uh, in the code to avoid all the map produce uh, syntax syntactic overhead? I mean, I, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Okay, uh, you, for example, you would uh, say my list uh, dot uh, filter something dot uh, aggregate dot select dot. Uh, uh, you, you mean within the JavaScript functions that I presented? Yeah, uh, like, um, a, like a, a builder pattern, pattern, for example. Yeah, I mean, uh, that would be something that you would want to build into a library. Mm -hmm. um, I only used what's built in to React and to the JavaScript runtime uh, because I didn't want to hide away anything that I was doing under some kind of veneer. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, that's absolutely something you should do, uh, is build higher abstractions on top. Um, I, I find myself, especially, um, let me see if I can pop it up here, um, especially on the pattern of group by. Uh, yeah, I find myself doing this reduce over a list, mm -hmm. push things into an accumulator object a lot. Um, and we're, we're always keeping our eyes open for things that can be abstracted like that. Um, this is one that could easily be extracted into a separate function that you could just call um, yeah. without needing to build this up every time. So, yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much.